Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the metabotropic glutamate receptors and how they can produce calcium oscillations. And specifically, it's the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5 which can produce calcium oscillations. Okay, so so far we've seen how um, activation of mGluR5 can lead to the opening of calcium channels, these IP3 receptors, or at least priming them so that they're ready to open. What we haven't seen is how this is going to oscillate at all. Okay, so basically, we're going to have to look at this other arm of this pathway. So we saw that uh, the um, activation of the metabotropic glutamate receptor 5 by glutamate is going to lead to the production of alpha-Q uh, subunits bound to GTP, which activate the enzyme phospholipase C-beta, which then begins breaking down phosphatidyl inositol 45 bisphosphate into inositol 145 trisphosphate and diacylglyceride. Okay, now we've talked about what IP3 does. Let's talk about what diacylglyceride does. Basically, diacylglyceride stays in the phospholipid bilayer, firstly, so it will be up here somewhere like this. Uh, because these hydrophobic tails are nicely interacting with the other hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids. So it's going to stay in the membrane, and what it's going to do is it's going to activate another enzyme which is membrane-bound. And this is the enzyme protein kinase C, a very important enzyme. Uh, so what should I call this? Uh, where should I write its name, rather? Um, not calling it anything. Um, Okay, so protein kinase C is the name of this enzyme. And basically, it's going to be activated by this diacylglyceride. Okay, so diacylglyceride activates protein kinase C. That worked well. And what is protein kinase C going to do? Well, it's going to lead to a negative feedback loop on this mGluR5 receptor up here. So this is the mGluR5 receptor here. Okay. And basically what's going to happen is that protein kinase C is a serine threonine kinase. And what it's going to do is it's going to phosphorylate a threonine residue on this, um, on this mGluR5 residue up here. Okay? And specifically it's going to phosphorylate um, a threonine at position 840. So let me show you this. Threonine 840. So, uh, the amino acid threonine has this structure. Here's the amino terminus. So at the moment I'm just drawing the basic amino acid structure. Here's the alpha carbon. Here's the carboxyl group of the amino acid. Here's the hydrogen off the alpha carbon. And now the threonine, you have a carbon coming off here, a, a, a hydroxyl group here, a methyl group off here as well, and a hydrogen like that. So this is the amino acid threonine. And basically, what protein kinase C is going to do is you have one of these residues at position 840 of this mGluR5 receptor. So that means this is a great big polypeptide. If you count along the amino acids from the starting one over here, so you start at number one, you keep counting, and you go all the way up to 840th amino acid, it will be a threonine. And basically, protein kinase C is going to add a phosphate group onto that threonine. So what that means is it's going to take a, that hydrogen off and it's going to put a phosphate group on like so. Okay, and this is the important thing basically. When you, um, when you put that phosphate group on now like this, it's on this cytosolic portion here and that cytosolic portion is important for interacting with your uh, heterotrimeric G protein here basically. So, when you put that phosphate group on there, uh, what happens is the, the, the receptor can't interact with the uh, heterotrimeric G protein anymore. So putting this phosphate group on here basically stops the metabotropic glutamate receptor from interacting with its GQ protein. So basically we say it uncouples uh, the receptor from its G, G protein basically, uncouples receptor from G protein. You will hear that expression quite a lot. So the receptor is no longer able to interact with the um, heterotrimeric G protein, uncouples receptor from GQ. Okay, so uh, that means that 
Even though the glutamate is still bound to the mGluR5 potentially, what's going to happen? You're going to stop activating these heterotrimeric G proteins. That, what, that, what's going to happen now is that um, you're going to um, the amount of alpha Q GTP you've got is going to go down because these alpha Q uh, subunits they have an intrinsic GTPase which is going to cleave this GTP into GDP so they will inactivate after a certain amount of time so this is going to inactivate then it will stop stimulating phospholipase C beta okay so phospholipase C beta's activity will go down. This will mean that the cleavage of PIP2 into diacylglyceride and inositol 145 trisphosphate will go down. So you'll stop making more diacylglyceride. Now the diacylglyceride is not allowed to just stay in the membrane. It's going to be degraded as well. It will have phosphate groups back, put back onto it in order to uh, return it to phospholipids, basically. So uh, if you stop producing more diacylglyceride, the amount of diacylglyceride in the membrane is going to go down. So the activation of protein kinase C is going to go down. Uh, moreover, if you stop producing uh, IP3 as well, so IP3 is also going to be degraded. It's going to be degraded by phosphatases, which will break off the phosphate groups, basically. This fourth one goes first. Okay, and um, once it's degraded, it will stop activating uh, these IP3 receptors. So IP3 goes down, basically. But it, more also, what's going to happen is that the protein kinase C activity is going to go down. So both of these pathways, their activity is going to go down. Now, if protein kinase C's activity goes down, what's going to happen is that this phosphate group is eventually going to get cleaved off this threonine, and it's not going to be put back on if the protein kinase C is now inactive. So the receptor will become active again. It will go through all of this pathway again to produce IB3 back up. So you're going to get oscillatory action, basically, because, um, let me show you. If we plot against time here the concentration of IP3, like so, then when we initially add the glutamate, what happens is IP3 concentration goes up, okay? Now, what starts to happen, though, is that this diacylglyceride starts building up, activating protein kinase C, and that inactivates this receptor, okay? So it stops the activation of the phospholipase C beta because you've inactivated all of this, right? So if phospholipase C beta stops actively um, cleaving PIP2 into diacylglyceride and inositol 145-trisphosphate, then you've, you've stopped your production, basically, of IP3. But there are phosphatases waiting to break this down into IP2, basically, like so. So, you've got the destruction of IP2, uh, IP3, rather, and you are not making any more IP3. So, overall, that's going to lead to IP3 levels going back down, okay? But... Then, what also happens is the diacylglyceride level goes down because phospholipase C beta has become inactive. So this goes down because it's being returned to phospholipids and you've stopped making more of it. So the activation of protein kinase C goes um, down and then uh, protein kinase C stops adding phosphate groups onto these muscarinic, uh, sorry, not muscarinic, metabotropic glutamate receptor 5s some phosphatase is going to come along and cleave this phosphate group off, or it's just going to fall off by itself. That will mean that this receptor becomes active again, presuming the glutamate is still there. So the process will start all over again, and you will get IP3 going up again like so. So you'll get oscillations in IP3 level. Okay, and now what's important to understand is if you get oscillations in IP3 level, then the primedness of these IP3 receptors will also be oscillating and therefore um, the stimulation of the IP3 receptors will be oscillating as well. So the amount of calcium that's coming out of the IP3 receptors, out of the intracellular stores, is also going to be oscillating. So you're going to get calcium released from the, endo uh, from the endoplasmic reticular stores going up when IP3 is high and then when IP3 goes down, you're going to stop releasing calcium from the ER. And, of course, the pump circa, which I'll draw here, is going to be returning the calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum. So here's circa. 
the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. And basically, circa pumps uh, two calciums into the endoplasmic reticulum lumen uh, for free protons going out and also the hydrolysis of ATP. So sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. So the point is that you've got enzymes which are, or uh, transporters which are moving um, the calcium back into the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is moving two calcium in uh, and free protons out and also hydrolyzing ATP to ADP, an inorganic phosphate, and using the energy from that to um, move the calcium against its concentration gradient. Okay, so overall you return the calcium back in, so calcium levels go down again, and then when IP3 levels go back up, that causes the release of calcium again through the IP3 receptors, and then when it IP3 goes down, the circa returns the calcium back in. So overall, what you also get is oscillations in calcium. And this is basically one of the only mechanisms you will see where oscillations in calcium are speculated to be caused by oscillations in IP3 level. Now, I want to just say this mechanism is controversial. We, the jury is still out on whether this really happens because initially when they found this threonine 840 and this mechanism by which protein kinase seek phosphorylate it, they thought, brilliant. This is, this is how you uh, get calcium oscillations in response to this m -glu r 5 But then, someone did an experiment where they actually put m -glu r 5 into hex cells, human embryonic kidney cells. And basically, when you try and actually measure these IP3 uh, fluctuations, which we speculate exist in these hex cells, the data you get is quite unconvincing. You do see oscillations, but they're tiny, pretty much. Um, so the jury's still out on whether this exists, but it is a nice model, at least.